Long Walk to Freedom, the autobiography of Nelson Mandela, written by Nelson Mandela and narrated by Kathy Kareem. I dedicate this book to my six children, Maliba and Makazue, my first daughter, who are now deceased, and to Magatho, Makazue, Zinani and Zinzi, whose support and love I treasure. To my 21 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren who give me great pleasure. And to all my comrades, friends and fellow South Africans whom I serve and whose courage, determination and patriotism remain my source of inspiration. Acknowledgements. As readers will discover, this book has a long history. I began writing it clandestinely in 1974 during my imprisonment on Robben Island. Without the tireless labour of my old comrades Walter Sizulu and Ahmed Kathrada for reviving my memories, it is doubtful the manuscript would have been completed. The copy of the manuscript which I kept with me was discovered by the authorities and confiscated. However, in addition to their unique calligraphic skills, my co-prisoners Mac Maharaj and Isu Chiba had ensured that the original manuscript safely reached its destination. I resumed work on it after my release from prison in 1990. Since my release, my schedule has been crowded with numerous duties and responsibilities which have left me little free time for writing. Fortunately, I have had the assistance of dedicated colleagues, friends and professionals who have helped me complete my work at last and to whom I would like to express my appreciation. I am deeply grateful to Richard Stengel who collaborated with me in the creation of this book providing invaluable assistance in editing and revising the first parts and in the writing of the latter parts. I recall with fondness our early morning talks in the trans game and the many hours of interviews at Shell House in Johannesburg and my home in Houghton. A special tribute is owed to Mary Pfaff, who assisted Richard in his work. I have also benefited from the advice and support of Fatima Mir, Peter Magubane, Nadine Gordima, and Ezekiel Mamfale. I want to thank especially my comrade Ahmed Katrada for the long hours spent revising, correcting and giving accuracy to the story. Many thanks to my ANC office staff who patiently dealt with the logistics of the making of this book, but in particular to Barbara Masekela for her efficient coordination. Likewise, Iqbal Mir has devoted many hours to watching over the business aspects of the book. I am grateful to my editor, William Phillips of Little Brown, who has guided this project from early 1990 on and edited the text, and to his colleagues Jordan Pavlin, Steve Schneider, Mike Mattil, and Donna Peterson. I would also like to, to thank Professor Gail Gerhardt for her factual review of the manuscript. Part 1. A Country Childhood Apart from life, a strong constitution and an abiding connection to the Thembu royal house, the only thing my father bestowed upon me at birth was a name, Rohilala. In Koza, Rohilala literally means pulling the branch of a tree, but its colloquial meaning more accurately would be troublemaker. I do not believe that names are destiny or that my father somehow divined my future, but in later years, friends and relatives would ascribe to my birth name the many storms I have both caused and weathered. My more familiar English or Christian name was not given to me until my first day of school, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I was born on the 18th of July, 1918, at Mveso a tiny village on the banks of the Membashi River in the district of Umtata, the capital of the Transkei. The year of my birth marked the end of the Great War, 
the outbreak of an influenza epidemic that killed millions, that killed millions throughout the world, and the visit of a delegation of the African National Congress to the Versailles Peace Conference to voice the grievances of the African people of South Africa. Mveso, however, was a place apart, a tiny precinct removed from the world of great events, where life was lived much as it had been for hundreds of years. The Transke is 800 miles east of Cape Town, 550 miles south of Johannesburg, and lies between the Kay River and the Natal border, between the rugged Drunkensberg Mountains to the north and the blue waters of the Indian Ocean to the east. It is a beautiful country of rolling hills, fertile valleys, and a thousand rivers and streams, which keep the landscape green even in winter. The Transke used to be one of the largest territorial divisions within South Africa, covering an area the size of Switzerland, with a population of about three and a half million Kozas, and a tiny minority of Basothos and Whites. It is home to the Thembu people, who are part of the Koza nation, of which I am a member. My father, Gadla Henry Mufakanyisiwa, was a chief by both blood and custom. He was confirmed as chief of Mvezo by the king of the Thembu tribe, but under British rule, his selection had to be ratified by the government, which in Mvezo took the form of the local magistrate. As a government-appointed chief, he was eligible for a stipend, as well as a portion of the fees the government levied on the community for vaccination of livestock and communal grazing land. Although the role of chief was, ven was a venerable and esteemed one, it had even 75 years ago, become debased by the control of an unsympathetic white government. The Thembu tribe reaches back for 20 generations to King Swide. According to tradition, the Thembu people lived in the foothills of the Drakensberg Mountains and migrated toward the coast in the 16th century, where they were incorporated into the Koza nation. The Koza are part of the Nguni people, who have lived, hunted, and fished in the rich and temperate southeastern region of South Africa, between the Great Interior Plateau to the north and the Indian Ocean to the south, since at least the 11th century. The Nguni can be divided into a northern group, the Zulu and the Swazi people, and a southern group, which is made up of Amabaka, Amabomiana, Amagakaleka, Ama Mfengu, Ama Mpodomis, Ama Mpondo, Abe Sotho, and Abe Tembu, and together they comprise the Koza nation. The Koza are a proud and patrilineal people with an expressive and euphonious language and an abiding belief in the importance of laws, education, and courtesy. Koza society was a balanced and harmonious social order in which every individual knew his or her place. Each Koza belongs to a clan that traces its descent to a specific forefather. I am a member of the Madiba clan, named after a Thembu chief who ruled in the Transke in the 18th century. I am often addressed as Madiba, my clan name, a term of respect. Ungbuku Cheka, one of the greatest monarchs who united the Thembu tribe, died in 1832. As was the custom, he had wives from the principal royal houses. The great house, from which the hair is selected, the right-hand house, and the exiba, a minor house that is referred to by some as the left-hand house. It was the task of the sons of the exiba, or left-hand house, to settle royal disputes. Um Thikrakra, the eldest son of the great house, succeeded Ungubuku Chuka, and amongst his sons were Nganjalizwe and Matanzima, Sabat Sabata, who ruled the Thembu from 1954, was the grandson of Nganjalizwe and a senior to Kalza Daliwonga, better known as K.D. Matanzima, the former chief minister of the Transke. My nephew, by law and custom, who was a descendant of Matanzima. The eldest son of the Igziba house was Simakade, whose younger brother was Mandela, my grandfather. 
Although over the decades there have been many stories that I was in line of succession to the Thembu throne, the simple gene genealogy I have just outlined exposes those tales as a myth. Although I was a member of the royal household, I was not among the privileged few who were trained for rule. Instead, as a descendant of the Exiba house, I was groomed, like my father before me, to counsel the rulers of the tribe. My father was a tall, dark-skinned man with a straight and stately posture, which I like to think that I inherited. He had a tuft of white hair just above his forehead, and as a boy I would take white ash and rub it into my hair in imitation of him. My father had a stern manner and did not spare the rod when disciplining his children. He could be exceedingly stubborn, another trait that may, unfortunately, have been passed down from father to son. My father has sometimes been referred to as the Prime Minister of Thembuland during the reigns of Danlin Diebo the father of Sabata, who ruled in the early 1900s, and that of his son, Jongin Taba, who succeeded him. That is a misnomer, in that no such title existed, but the role he played was not so different from the designation implies, from what the designation implies. As a respected and valued counsellor, he accompanied them on their travels and was usually to be found by their sides during the important meetings with government officials. He was an acknowledged custodian of Koza history and it was partially for that reason that he was valued as an advisor. My own interest in history had early roots and was encouraged by my father. Although my father could neither read nor write, he was reputed to be an excellent orator who captivated his audience by entertaining them as well as teaching them. In later years, I discovered that my father was not only an advisor to kings, but a king-maker. After the untimely death of Jongi Lizere in the 1920s, his son Sabata, the infant of the great wife, was too young to ascend to the throne. A dispute arose as to which of Danlin Diebo's three most senior sons from other mothers, Jongintaba, Dabula Manzi, and Melithafa should be selected to succeed him. My father was consulted and recommended Jongintaba on the grounds that he was the best educated. Jongintaba, he argued, would not only be a fine custodian of the crown, but an excellent mentor to the young prince. My father and a few other influential chiefs had the great respect for education that is often present in those who are uneducated. The recommendation was controversial, for Jongin Taba's mother was from a lesser house, but my father's choice was ultimately accepted by both the Thembus and the British government. In time, Jongin Tamba would return the favour the favor, in a way that my father could not then imagine. All told, my father, all told, my father had four wives, the third of whom, my mother, Nosekeni Fani, the daughter of Inkindama from the Amapembu clan of the Koza, belonged to the right-hand house. Each of these wives, the great wife, the right-hand wife, my mother, the left-hand wife, and the wife of Ikadi, or support house, had her own kraal. A kraal was a homestead, and usually included a simple fenced in enclosure for animals, fields for growing crops, and one or more thatched huts. The kraals of my father's wives were separated by many miles, and he commuted among them. In these travels, my father served thirteen children in all, four boys and nine girls. I am the eldest of the right-hand house, and the youngest of my father's four sons. I have three sisters, Baliwe, who was the oldest girl, Notanku and Makutswana. Although the eldest of my father's sons was Malalwa, my father's heir as chief was Dalikli, the son of his, the great house, who died in the early 1930s. All of his sons, with the exception of myself, are now deceased, and each was my senior, not only in age, but in status. When I was not much more than a newborn child, 
my father was involved in a dispute that deprived him of his chieftainship at Mvezo and revealed a strain in his character I believe he passed on to his son. I maintain that nurture, rather than nature, is the primary moulder of personality. But my father possessed a proud rebelliousness, a stubborn sense of fairness, that I recognise in myself. As a chief, or headman as it was often known among the whites, my father was compelled to account for his stewardship, not only to the Thembu king, but to the local magistrate. One day, one of my father's subjects lodged a complaint against him involving an ox that had strained, strayed from its owner. The magistrate accordingly sent a message ordering my father to appear before him. When my father received the summons, he sent back the following reply, Andizi, Andisakula, I will not come, I am still girding for battle. One did not defy the magistrates in those days. Such behaviour would be regarded as the height of insolence, insolence, and in this case it was. My father's response bespoke his belief that the magistrates had no legitimate power over him. When it came to tribal matters, he was guided not by the laws of the King of England, but by Thembu custom. This defiance was not fit of a peak, but a matter of principle. He was asserting his traditional prerogative as a chief and was challenging the authority of the magistrate. When the magistrate received my father's response, he promptly charged him with insubordination. There was no inquiry or investigation. That was reserved for white civil servants. The magistrate simply deposed my father, thus ending the Mandela family chieftainship. I was unaware of these events at the time, but I was not unaffected. My father, who was a wealthy nobleman by the standards of his time, lost both his fortune and his title. He was deprived of most of his herd and land and the revenue that came with them. Because of our straitened circumstances, my mother moved to Kunu, a slightly larger village north of Mvezo, where she would have the support of friends and relations. We lived in a less grand style in Kunu, but it was in that village near Umtata that I spent the happiest years of my boyhood and whence I trace my earliest memories. <laughs>